The title of the sermon this morning is Lessons on Servanthood. Lessons on Servanthood. We're going to be in John chapter 13. How would you define success? Success. Is it winning? Is it reaching the top of the ladder? Is it accomplishing your goals? Is it wealth? Is it fame? Jesus had a very, very clear definition of success and of greatness. And it's very different from the world. This is what he said in Mark 10, 43. He said, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you will be a slave to all. So to Jesus, a successful person is one who embraces a life of humble servanthood. That's greatness to Jesus. That's what success is Jesus to Jesus. That's a successful person, someone who has lived well. It's not about the size of your bank account, how many assets you have, how wealthy you are, how popular you are what your position is at work, what kind of job you do, what kind of career you have. To Jesus, it's really about your attitude. It's embracing a life of humble servanthood. And that's what the Christian life is all about. This morning, we're going to learn more about how to be servants because that's what this story is about in John chapter 13. So we're going to be in verses 1 through 20. We've made it to um, a new chapter this morning. And this is really the second half if you will, of the Gospel of John. Um, So we are on Thursday night. That's where this story picks up. Thursday night, the night before his death. So verse 1, it says, Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The night before Christ's death, Jesus and his disciples were in an upstairs room and they were celebrating the Passover feast together. This is known as the Last Supper. It was whenever um, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. This is whenever it happened. And it's interesting that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, The Synoptic Gospels, there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels, meaning they are similar. And in the Synoptic Gospels, in the upper room, they all record Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper. John doesn't mention that at all. Instead, John focuses on something that they didn't mention. John focuses how on that night, Jesus washed his disciples' feet. And that's what what the focus of this morning is is going to be about. So, excuse me, verse 2. Now, when it was time for supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel, and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel tied around him. So again, Jesus is in a room eating dinner with 12 grown men. And imagine living in that part of the world in that time of history where people wore sandals, people walked everywhere, and the roads were almost all dirt roads. And so their feet got very, very dirty. And when people would arrive at a banquet or a feast, the host would usually provide water so that the guests upon entering the home could wash their feet. And if the host was a person of means, uh, they would have a slave. And the slave, the, the lowest of slaves would have this job. When people would come in, the slave would be there to wash people's feet as they came in. But on this occasion, in fact, by the way, uh, foot washing was usually reserved for the lowest of non-Jewish slaves. It wasn't something that a Jew, Jew, even a Jewish slave would usually do. Peers would never wash each other's feet, you know, equals. And um, on this occasion, there was obviously, or apparently, no water placed at the, at the door at the entrance. And there was no servant to wash anyone's feet. 
and none of the disciples volunteered to wash anybody else's feet, not even their rabbi's feet, not even Jesus' feet. And so Jesus volunteered. Jesus, as the leader, he washed their feet during the meal. Verse 6, he came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I'm doing, you don't realize now or you don't understand now, but afterward you will understand. Verse 8, you will never wash my feet, Peter said. Jesus replied, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. So Peter, it's interesting in this story, first he shows humility whenever he says, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? You, the Son of God, washing my feet? There's something backwards about this. You shouldn't be washing my feet. But then Jesus explained that it's necessary. And so in the very next verse, we're going to see Peter starts giving Jesus orders. He says, Jesus if I have to be washed, don't just wash my feet. Wash my hands and my head as well. So now he's gone from humility to pride because now he's giving orders to Jesus. And if you, if you read the Gospels and know Peter, you understand that's his personality. But starting here, we see that Christ uses this foot washing as a symbol of four different spiritual lessons. And so I'm going to walk through those for you briefly. So this foot washing, he used it to teach four different spiritual truths. The first one is that we must have our sins washed away by Jesus Christ in order to have a relationship with God. And that's what we just read in verse 8. He's, whenever Peter said, Lord, don't, don't wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Obviously, Jesus was speaking symbolically here. He was saying, if you're not washed, if your sins are not washed away by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, then you can't have a relationship with God. Titus 2.14 says, He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. So when we put our faith in Jesus, God forgives us, washes our way our sins, we're reconciled to God. So that's the first lesson Jesus is teaching with, with foot washing. Then in verse 9, Peter comes back and he says, it says, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. And then verse 10, one who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You are clean but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. This is why he said, not all of you are clean. The second lesson symbolized by foot washing is that you only need to be saved once. You only need to be saved once. You can only be saved once, matter of fact. When Jesus told Peter that it was necessary for his feet to be washed in order to have a relationship with Christ, Peter said, well, then wash my hands and my feet as well. But Jesus told him, if somebody has already bathed, then they only need to wash their feet, and they'll be fully clean. In other words, back then, a person, when they would go to a banquet, they would bathe, right, before going to a banquet. Banquet, So they're, they're completely clean, but when they get to the banquet, their feet are dirty. So when they get there, all they have to do is bathe their feet, wash their feet, feet and then they're, they're com completely clean. And so Jesus was saying was that if you've been saved, you don't need to be, if you've been washed, your sins have been washed away by Jesus Christ. You don't need that to happen again. You don't have to be saved all over again. And we know this is the case. The Bible teaches that once you're saved, you're always saved. You cannot lose your salvation. And so the reason why is because of what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29. This should provide hope and comfort for you, that you don't have to worry about losing your salvation. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And then in verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand, out of the father's hand. So first he says, nobody can snatch them out of my hand and nobody can snatch them out of the father's hand. So once you've been saved, once you've been washed, 
You don't need to be washed again. You don't need to be bathed again. That's the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach Peter. Now, what if you commit a really bad sin, a really horrible sin? Well, God didn't save you in the first place because you were a good person, did he? He saved you because you were a bad person. You needed saving. And so if God didn't save you because you were a good person, what makes you think you'll lose your salvation if you do something bad? And so the lesson that I try to try to instill in this congregation is that you have to separate your performance from your salvation. You have to disconnect the two. Your performance, as far as being religious, keeping God's commands, is not connected to your salvation other than as evidence of your salvation. But your salvation is not based on how well you live up to Christ's standards. Jesus accomplished everything necessary for your salvation on the cross. The only thing you contribute to your salvation are the sins that Jesus had to die for, and then your faith. That's the only thing you do to get saved, is put your faith in Jesus Christ. And so usually, whenever we begin to doubt our salvation, it's because we've, we've fallen away. We've backslidden. We've done some things that we know are against God's will, and we start to feel guilty, and we start to think, Man, surely God's mad at me. I hope I didn't lose myself. What are you doing? You're focusing on your performance again. But your salvation was never based on your performance. It's all about putting your faith in Christ's performance on your behalf. The third lesson symbolized by foot washing is that you must regularly confess your sins. You have to regularly confess your sins. So in verse 10, again, Jesus says, One who has bathed doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. So Jesus was teaching Peter, you don't need to be resaved over and over again, because once you've been washed, you're clean. You just got to wash your feet every once in a while. What Jesus was saying is that whenever you sin as a Christian, and you do sin at times as a Christian, sometimes unintentionally, and sadly, sometimes deliberately. And when you sin, you don't lose your salvation, but you do lose intimacy, don't you? You lose that closeness with God, and you lose God's anointing. You lose God's full blessing and protection. You lose that sense of guidance. You lose that inner peace and the joy. And so to re-get that intimacy with God, to reconnect with God, what do you do? Well, the Bible says you need to confess your sins. In other words, you need to go to the Lord, not to me, but you need to go to the Lord and you say, Lord, I, I sinned against you. Here's what I did wrong. I'm sorry that was wrong and I, and I repent. Please forgive me. And the Bible says that God will forgive you each and every time. 1 John 1, 9 is a great verse. I know that a lot of the kids have memorized it in Bible drill. It says, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's similar to a parent-child relationship. When I sin against one of my daughters, for example, by saying something hurtful, saying something rude, and uh, that happens from time to time. But when I say something hurtful to one of my daughters, I don't stop being their father. I'm still their dad. And so to reestablish that relationship with them because once I sin against them, our intimacy is broken. We're, we're, not, on the, we're not close anymore. There's like a, a rift between us, a wall between us. You can just tell we're not close just because I sinned. And so to regain that intimacy and that closeness, I don't need to re-adopt my daughter. All I need to do is confess. All I need to do is go to my daughter and say, I'm sorry. I messed up. I said something I shouldn't have said. Sorry, I hurt your feelings. Would you please forgive me? And then we can be reunited. It's the same in your relationship with God. And so to confess your sins, in 1 John 1, 9, I've written down four A's next to that verse of what it means to actually confess your sins. So in your Bible, if you want to real quick, you can turn to 1 John 1, 9, or you can just write this in your worship guide if you want to put this in your Bible sometime. But what does it mean to actually confess? If you confess your sins, he is faithful, faithful and righteous to forgive you, and to cleanse you. 
Well, to confess means first admit your sin by name. In other words, get real with the Lord and, and get specific and say, Lord, I said something I shouldn't have said. Or I looked at something I shouldn't have looked at. I thought and dwelled on things I shouldn't have thought about. I, I stole something. Or be, be real clear, real specific. The second A is apologize. That's what you do whenever you're trying to reconnect with someone that you've sinned against, right? You say, I shouldn't have done that. that was, here's what I did. I'm sorry. Apologize to the Lord. And then third, you want to affirm Affirm your commitment to obedience. So whenever I mess up and I sin against my wife, for example, I have to admit my sin, apologize, and then she needs to hear that I'm, that I'm recommitting to not doing that anymore, to being a good guy again. That I, in other words, when you apologize, you're basically saying, I'm going to try my best not to repeat that stupidity. So you've got to apo- admit your sin, apologize, affirm your commitment, and then ask for forgiveness. Please forgive me. Please forgive me, Lord. And the Bible promises, whenever you're sincere, he stands ready to forgive you and take you back in that intimate, close relationship each and every time. And so Jesus is trying to teach that you don't need to be resaved. You only need to be saved once. However, from time to time, probably daily, and this is why in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus added this in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And your, and your daily prayer, you probably need to pray that. You're not praying to be resaved. You're praying for, for, for forgiveness of those just daily sins that you may commit. Okay, verse 12. When Jesus has wa- had washed their feet and put on his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to them. So this is one of those times whenever Jesus... <coughs> actually explains, gives us some commentary as to what he meant, and we don't have to speculate. He says, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are speaking rightly, since that's what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do, just as I have done for you. Truly, I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. In other words, if I, as your master and teacher, was willing to stoop so low as to become a foot washer, don't think that you'll be above that. You need to do the same. Verse 17, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. So here's the fourth lesson symbolized by the foot washing Jesus is teaching them about servanthood. We have to, to, to follow Christ means embracing a life of humble servanthood. That's what he was teaching his disciples. Verse 13, he says, For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. Now, there are some Christian denominations who believe that Jesus was instituting a third ordinance here, the ordinance of foot washing. And so some churches, when they gather together, like we are doing this morning, they actually include not just the ordinance of baptism and the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, but also the ordinance of foot washing. And so they have a ceremonial foot washing in church. Uh, But most Christians throughout history have understood Jesus to simply be teaching the principle of humble servanthood, the importance of, of being a humble servant as a Christian. And that's what it means to be a Christian. Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, this is what he came to do. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus went around helping people spiritually and physically, meeting their needs. In the end, he performed the ultimate act of servanthood when he died on the cross for our sins. I love Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Notice that it describes his humble servanthood. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. So Jesus 
came as a servant. And he teaches us to do the same. He taught us this is what greatness and success are all about. Mark 10.43 says, Whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. You want to achieve greatness? You want to achieve success in life? That's what it's about, being a humble servant. And let's finish off the passage. Verse 18, Jesus said, I'm not speaking about all of you. In other words, where he says, I've given you an example to follow. And he, he said, some of you are clean. I mean, you're, you are already clean, so you don't need to be rewashed. He wasn't talking about all of them. I know those I have chosen, but the scripture must be fulfilled. The one who eats my bread has raised his heel against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does not, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. In other words, I'm telling you something's going to happen in advance so that when it happens, you'll see it'll help you to believe in me. Verse 20, truly I tell you, whoever receives anyone I send receives me, and the one who receives me receives him who sent me. So Jesus knew he was going to be betrayed, and by whom? He knew it was going to be Judas Iscariot. So he says, I'm not speaking about all of you. He knew that there was one who was going to betray him. He says, I know those I have chosen. I know those I have chosen. Jesus chose, handpicked the 12 disciples, and he knew them backwards and forwards. He knew which were sincere, and he, he knew which of his disciples were insincere, were fakers. And so he knew Judas Iscariot. He knew his heart. He knew what he was going to do. So the point of the major focus of this passage is on servanthood. So let's talk about how we can embrace a life of humble servanthood. Eight lessons on servanthood that come from this example of Jesus. Number one, if you're taking notes, servanthood flows from a heart of love. Servanthood flows from a heart of love. If we go back to verse one, it says, before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to, to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Christ was able to perform such an act of humble, menial service because of his love for his disciples. That was where his energy, his motivation came from. To become a great servant, you have to have great love. If you don't love people, you're not going to serve them. If your love is small, your service will be small. If your love is great, your service will be great. Christ performed the ultimate act of servanthood because his love for us was ultimate. To grow in servanthood, you have to grow in love. You need more love. How do you grow in love? Three ways. First of all, you have to know what love is. You have to know what love is. And we learn that from God's word. The Bible says in John, 1 John 4, 8, 1 John 4, 16, that God is love. So we learn how to love, we learn what real love is by looking at God and studying God's word and studying God's ways and studying Jesus Christ and how he lived and how he interacted. But you have to learn what love is. And then, you know, the world is very confused about love. Do not get your definition of love from the media or from Hollywood or from social media. You have to get your love from God. That's the true definition of love. A second way to grow in love is you have to remember your neighbor's value. If, if you want to serve your neighbor, you're going to have to remember and recognize their value as a human being. Your neighbor is infinitely valuable because God created him in his image. God loves them. Christ died for them. God watches over them all the time, and they will live for eternity. They're an eternal soul, either in heaven or in hell. So your neighbors have infinite value, regardless of what they look like, regardless of how much money they make, regardless of what they believe. You have to realize that. A third way to grow in love is that you have to ask God to fill your heart with love. So if you find that you struggle being a servant, you struggle truly humbling yourself and offering yourself in selfless ways, well, you need more love. And you can't just psych yourself self up 
into becoming a servant, not consistently. You really need God's love. And the Bible says you can pray for that. In fact, I'm not going to read it to you, but in 1 Thessalonians 3.12, Paul prayed for the Thessalonians that their love for each other would increase. So that's something you can pray for and should pray for. God, increase my love so that I can be the kind of servant that you want me to be. Okay, number two, the second lesson about servanthood is that servanthood never retires. Servant, servanthood never retires. You never get to the point in your life where you stop serving. And back to verse 1. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. Jesus knew that he had less than 24 hours to live. He knew this was the end. And yet he used his final moments to serve. That's what we do. That's what Christians do. We serve all the way to the end. As you get older, it may be easy to say, you know what, I've served all my life. I've given so much. I've helped so many people. Now it's time for me to just sit and relax and be served. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with sitting and relaxing and being served. There's nothing wrong with playing. There's nothing wrong with having a good time. But you never get to the point as a Christian where you stop serving the Lord. That's who you are, not just what you do. As a Christian, you are a servant of others and a servant of God. Our church is blessed with several older folks who are retired but they haven't stopped serving the Lord. In fact, they serve more now probably than they did whenever they were fully employed because now they have more time to do what they really want to do, which is serve, serve the Lord, serve people. And those of you who are retired and older, we appreciate y'all. We appreciate your example. You really do help us grow more mature in Christ. But servanthood not only never retires, but it never really takes a day off. In other words, you never take, take a day where you say, today, I'm just going to be selfish. <laughs> Every day, even when you're on vacation, even on your day off, you still have the attitude of a servant. You never know when God is going to present an opportunity to you where you need to step up and serve. Number three, servanthood requires humility. Servanthood requires humility. Look back at verses two and three. Now, when it was time for supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going to, back to God. So, Jesus, John points out, knew two things. And the, number one, he knew that the Father had given everything into his hands. In other words, he knew that he was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The second thing he knew is that he had come from the Father, was going back to the Father. He knew he was God. He knew he was no mere human. So he knew that he was above these disciples. He was not on their level. He was way above their level. But knowing these things, the very next verse says, knowing these things, he decided to serve them. That's humility. Even with this knowledge, he served his disciples. And, and what he showed us about humility is that as a, as a servant of the Lord, no person is beneath you. There is nobody too low for you to serve. To be a servant, you can't see anyone as beneath you. You can't see yourself as too important or too prestigious or too high to serve somebody. Everybody deserves your service because everyone is a child of God and you are God's servant. The second thing Jesus showed us about humility is that no job is beneath you. No job is beneath you. No person is beneath you. No job is beneath you. Not only did Jesus serve his disciples who were infinitely lower than him in status, but he served them in such a, a menial, mundane, disgusting way. These are 12 grown men with dirty feet and he washed their feet. This was something, again, that, that not even a Jewish slave would be asked to do. The lowest 
on the totem pole, the lowest slave on the totem pole would do this kind of work. No job is beneath you. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 tells us about humility, teaches us three things about humility. It says, do not or do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. So how to be humble, don't be selfish. Treat others as more important than you. Now, I've said this before, other people are not more important than you. But that's what the humble attitude does. It treats other people as more important than yourself. And then, third, don't think about what is best for yourself, but but about what is best for others. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. It's not putting yourself down. It's lifting God and others up. Robert Jeffress, he said, servanthood means putting the needs of other people above your own needs. It means making meeting the needs of others your priority in life. Every day we meet people with needs. The struggle is, are we going to meet their needs or our own? Humility. Number four, servanthood requires that you know your own value. Servanthood requires that you know your own value. Dawson Trotman was the founder of the Navigator's Ministry. He said, how do you know if you are a servant? By how you react when somebody treats you as one. If you want everybody to bow down to you, to be impressed with you, to see you as very important, then you can't be a servant. A servant doesn't need credit. He doesn't need the spotlight. He doesn't need to be rewarded or recognized. He just wants to serve, and he's serving for an audience of one. How do you get to that point, though, where your ego and your pride don't get in the way of your service to God and to others? You have to be secure in who you are so that you're not afraid of others seeing you in the role of a servant. The prideful person says, I'm important, I'm valuable, and if I do a menial job, then other people are going to see me as unimportant and unvaluable. The servant says, I'm important and valuable regardless of the task I do or what people say about me. In fact, the servant says, the reason why I'm important is because I'm a servant of the king. If you know your value, if you're secure in who you are, then you won't be afraid of others seeing you act like a servant. John 13, 3 says, Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, that he was going back to God. You see how Jesus knew his value? He knew who he was. So what is your value? Who are you? Let me remind you, you're loved by God. You are infinitely valuable. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are just as important and just as special as anyone else in the world. You're a child of God. You're a servant of God. You're a valued member of God's family. You're a spiritual brother or sister to every other Christian in the world. Your value is not determined by your net worth. It's not determined by what people think about you or say about you. Your value is not determined by what kind of career you have. Your value is not determined by how smart or beautiful you are. Your value is not determined by your education. Your value is determined by the fact that you're a child of God. Your significance is determined by the fact that you're a servant of God. So you have to know and believe that in order to serve others. Okay, number five, servanthood requires an eternal perspective. It requires an eternal perspective. Jesus was able to serve his disciples because he knew he was going back to the Father where he would once again sit on the throne and be treated with all the reverence and the respect and the worship that he deserves. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us about his perspective. It says, for the joy that lay before him, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was the joy that lay before him? He knew, of course, 
the results, the wonderful results of the cross were going to be the salvation of billions of people. But he also knew that, man, as soon as I die and rise again, I'll get to go back to the Father. I'll get to go back and sit on the throne in the place of glory. So it was his eternal perspective that helped him to serve. You have to keep your eyes on, your, on the heavenly reward. You know that God promises a reward for every act of service that you perform, everything done in Jesus' name. The size of your heavenly reward is determined by your earthly service. Galatians 6, 9. It says, let us not get tired of doing good. Why not? For we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. See, this verse is saying, you've got to keep your eternal perspective. You may not get recognized and rewarded in this life, but the recognition and the reward and the praise are coming. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 is another very encouraging verse for a servant. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. God is going to reward you. Robert Jeffress said, We will never consistently put the needs of others above our own, until we are convinced that there is a payoff down the line for doing that. When you serve somebody, God sees you, and God makes a record of it, and he's going to reward you. Keep your eyes on that. Number six, servanthood is required for leadership. That's another lesson about servanthood that Jesus teaches. It's required for leadership. In verse four, Jesus said, So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So Jesus was the leader, and yet he served those that he led. He was teaching an otherworldly concept of leadership, servant leadership. A leader's job is not simply to give orders and hold people accountable. A leader's job is to empower your people so that they can do the job to the best of their abilities. A leader's job is to create the conditions for excellent service. A leader's job is to meet your people's needs so that they can produce quality, a quality product. Andy Stanley said, God wants those in authority to leverage their authority for the benefit of those under their authority. You know, the term leader is mentioned only six times in the King James Bible while the term servant is mentioned more than 900 times. God has called you to be a servant. And it is, it's even more important whenever you're in a position of leadership, that you see yourself not as the person to be served and just to bark out orders, but the person who is to meet, the people of your, uh, your, meet your people's needs, empower them so that they can do the best job that they can do. James Hunter wrote the best book on leadership I've ever read. It's called The Servant. He said, a leader is someone who identifies and meets the legitimate needs of their people, removes all of the barriers so they can serve the customer. Number seven, servanthood is a command. Servanthood is a command. Verse four, so if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. This idea of humble servanthood is not a suggestion that you might want to consider. This really is a command, an imperative for Christians. If you want to live the Christian life, you need to understand it's about being a humble servant. And you need to embrace that. The Bible tells us to imitate Christ in all that we do. That's what it means to be a Christian, to be imitators of Jesus Christ. What is Christ like? John 13, 15. Jesus said, after he washed their feet, he says, for I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. To be an obedient, Christ-like Christian, you have to embrace servanthood. And then number eight, the last lesson about servanthood is that servanthood leads to joy. It leads to joy. Jesus says this in verse 17. Here's a promise 
that when you're reading this passage, it's such a short verse that it's easy to overlook. Jesus said, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. In other words, if you'll follow my example, if you'll follow my command of humble servanthood, you are blessed if you do them. You know, that, that word blessed can simply be translated happy. Happy. If you want to live a blessed life, a happy life, a fulfilling life, a life of joy, Jesus says servanthood is the path. The world will tell you something different. They will tell you what they've learned from their father, the devil. Happiness is found in physical pleasure and in wealth and in possessions and in being admired and being in love. The Bible says that you're blessed, you're happy if you embrace a life of servanthood. Paul said this in Acts 20.35. He was actually quoting Jesus. He said, it's more blessed to give than to receive takes a lot of faith to believe that, doesn't it? It's, it's contrary to human nature, which is to be happy, I need to take, take, take. But Jesus says, serve, give. That's what leads to happiness. In his book, Holy Subversion, Trevin Wax talks about two kinds of Christians. He talks about sink Christians and faucet Christians. A sink Christian they view salvation as they would a sink. The water of salvation flows into the sink so that the Christian, Christian can soak up all the benefits. Eternal life, assurance in the presence of God, strength in times of trial. Those who adopt this mindset concentrate solely on what the Bible says God has done and will do for them. They're sink Christians. And God has done a lot for us, is doing a lot for us. But a faucet Christian views salvation differently. They look at the world as the sink, sink and themselves as the faucet. The blessings of salvation flow to them in order to flow through them out to, to the wider world. They rightly see that the Bible describes salvation as something God not only does for them, but also through them. I want to encourage you to be a faucet Christian and not a sink Christian. And realize that, yes, God has blessed you, but he's blessed you to be a blessing. And so let God's Holy Spirit and God's blessings and God's salvation flow through you to those around you. You know, one of the first things you can do to be a servant of God, if you're a parent or a grandparent, is to focus on leading your children to Christ, discipling your children. And so I want to encourage you to keep doing that. It's one of the most important things you can possibly do. And then you can try to lead other people to Christ at work and in your circles of, of influence, your circles of friends. Try to be a witness. But then just look for opportunities in our church. We'll talk more about this next week as we talk about loving one another. But look for opportunities in the church, among church family. I'm not talking about just helping out, putting equipment away. I'm talking about look into the lives of your church family family members, and see how you can be of service to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this reminder of what Christianity is all about. It's not just about going to heaven. It's not just about getting strength for the hard times in life. It's about being blessed by you so that we can be a blessing. It's about being served by you so that now we can be a servant to others. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to do that. God, we pray that you would give us the love that we need to be able to carry out this service. Help us, Lord, to start by being servants in our homes to our parents, our siblings, our children, our grandchildren. And Lord, help it to, to carry over into our church. Help us to serve one another. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.